Good morning, everyone. This is Tim Gleisner, head of collections at the Library of Michigan, here uh, with the author of Grief's Country, uh, Gail Griffin, uh, winner of the 2021 Notable Book Award. And again, if you're looking for videos uh, or if you're looking up for other talks, just come to the Library of Michigan uh, webpage and we will have all of those up uh, shortly. So with that, Gail, good morning. How are you? Thank you, Tim. I'm delightful. How are you this morning? I'm doing really good. Very chipper. So good. everything is going good. Um, so Gail, let's just start off with you and tell us a little bit about yourself. What's your background and uh, how did you become a uh, writer? Oh, let's see. Um, I was born in Detroit and grew up in the suburbs and in Ann Arbor. Went away to school. Um, got my doctorate at the University of Virginia and came back to take a job at Kalamazoo College, which I held from 1977 until 2013. Seems like forever to me. Um, and it was there really that I, I became a writer. I, I wrote a lot as a kid, but never pursued it in school, never took creative writing classes, um, got into the mold of the literary criticism that they teach you to write as an English major. Mm -hmm. um, but at Kalamazoo College, I was in the presence of a very creative community and was really encouraged to write. And I discovered creative nonfiction in the 1980s and published a couple of books of creative nonfiction and just fell in love with that form and realized I was redefining myself in terms of being a writer. Um, so I was a little late to that self-definition, but glad I came to it. So what was what was the push that pushed you over the edge to, to actually write creative nonfiction and what were maybe some um, of your first subjects? What it really was, was that I was on a sabbatical, my first sabbatical, and I wanted to write a book about uh, coming to feminism as a teacher at K oh. College as it's always called around here. Sure. And um, it needed a voice that was different from the voice that I usually used writing critical articles about poems and stories and novels and such. And um, I also realized that I had been interested all my life in biography and autobiography. So okay. there was a deep love for nonfiction going on anyway. Right. And I thought, what if I try to write this book in just the most natural voice I can muster? And I did that. And it, it actually was kind of a leap because that kind of writing is not encouraged or was not encouraged in the, in the academic world. And I fell in love with sort of writing from a distinct first person perspective that could also be analytical and critical. Uh, and could take in my own experience, but also the culture around me, the society around me, history, the other things I'm fascinated by. Sure. So that's how it all came together. And I've just been reading it and studying it and writing it ever since. Were there any inspirational, well, not inspirational, but you know, inspirations for you or, or influences that you looked at and drew upon and said, yeah, I want to write like that? Oh, absolutely. Um, the, the nonfiction of Virginia Woolf. Okay. Um, especially her books, let's see, what were the ones that influenced me most? Almost all of her essays, but certainly um, her book called Three Guineas, mm -hmm. which is about the premise is she's been given three coins, guineas, and asked to donate them to um, various causes, and she has to decide which is the most important. Okay. And um, the book in which she talks about Shakespeare's sister, she imagines Shakespeare having a sister, Judith, okay. and what would have happened to that woman had she tried to be William Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And at the time that I read that essay for the first time, um, I was sort of coming to terms with issues of gender in the academic world and understanding why I'd never studied women writers. And so that was a profound influence on me. Um, another one was Adrian Rich, the poet, okay. um, who died just a few years ago. She was also a wonderful essayist. And she had some essays, notably one about Emily Dickinson, um, 
which approach Dickinson from a very personal first person perspective, which is what I was looking for and what I was interested in. So I watched these other brilliant women doing this and I thought I can do that too. Okay, so you had to discover these writers on your own. You didn't discover did. things through your education. And I mean, was there anything guiding you or you just heard, you know, like- Adrian Well, by the late seventies, mm -hmm. which is when I um, got my degree and came back to Michigan, um, there was quite an explosion of interest in women writers mm -hmm. and a lot of forgotten women writers were being brought to the fore again. And a lot of books that had gone out of print were finding print again. And uh, I found myself teaching that more and more and more in a curriculum that had maybe one or two women writers at most sure. in it. And that was true of most colleges. That's not a, a criticism of Kalamazoo College. That's just the way things were. Mm -hmm. um, but the more I learned about how many women writers there were out there and how they had been disrespected by tradition, by the academic tradition, the more I decided this is my work. So I developed a course in women's literature. It was the first one at Kalamazoo College. And every year I was including more and more and more writers um, that had been left by the wayside for very bad reasons. Um, and I got just passionate about that. So that was happening at exactly the same time that I was learning to be a writer. And I, and, I, and I hate to dwell, but I, I am fascinated by this, so I apologize, but... No, don't go ahead, dwell. Did you, did you feel supported by K College or Kalamazoo College uh, through this endeavor back in the early 80s, mid 80s? <laughs> yes and no. Um, <laughs> there was a lot of pushback from some of my more conservative colleagues. Okay. Um, there was such enthusiasm from the students, especially the women students. Sure, I can imagine. It was like they'd been in a desert and somebody offered them a glass of water. And this was happening across the curriculum. It wasn't just me, it was other people um, teaching women's history, um, emphasizing gender issues in anthropology, sure. psychology. So it, there, it was quite a volcano of activity and it was intellectually very exciting for me. And to pass that along to the students was exciting. So with the students' enthusiasm and interest, um, the pushback didn't really matter that much to me. I just sort of kept going and so did the rest of us. Okay. So but, oh yeah, I, I remember arguments against um, including Toni Morrison in our list of really important authors. Really? Yeah, now that's unthinkable, right? Yeah. Yeah, I remember the day she won the Nobel Prize and I just, I woke up, heard the news and started laughing. And I thought, yeah, vindicated <laughs> did you, did by you come in? Did you come in <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> did you come in with the newspaper and showing it to your fellow faculty members or no? Um, metaphorically, I did, Tim. I was <laughs> way too polite to do anything like that, but I came in with a grin on my face. Yes. Good for you. Good for yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> So let me ask, as a writer, I mean, did you develop the, the habits as a writer at that time that you have now, or how did that evolve over time? Oh, I, um, teaching at a small liberal arts college is a whole different thing. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's um, extremely labor-intensive, demanding. You're doing a lot of stuff besides walking into the classroom. And it was always, I always found it impossible to work seriously on a project unless I was on leave. Mm. So I wrote four books on four sabbaticals. So it's not like you woke up every morning, like no. an hour. I woke up every morning and got dressed and went to work <laughs> and came home at six o'clock at night, exhausted. Right. And scraped myself together for the next day. So no. Oh, okay. I mean, there was occasional, occasional little bursts of writing. And I was also trying to learn how to write poetry at the same time, um, but really sustained involvement with nonfiction writing came about every seven years when I was on leave and the three months of the year that the school wasn't in session. So what was the tradition like for that? So, I mean, did you go off to a certain place? Was there, you know, a place in the woods you went to? I, I'm just, <laughs> I I'm did. imagining, I, I'm imagining I, what this might be like. I've, 
rapidly understood that if I was really going to be serious about book projects, I needed to get out of town. I couldn't be in my house with my friends around and the college calling every day to, you know, ask me to do something or other. I had to, I had to get out of Dodge, as they say. So let's see, my first sabbatical was done at the Center for Research on Women at um, Douglas College of Rutgers University in New Jersey. Wonderful place, although New Jersey, Eastern New Jersey was not for me. Um, I live there, I understand. Oh boy, what a shock that was to a Midwestern yep. girl. Woo. Uh -huh. um, although going into New York on the bus every week to see shows wasn't bad. No, it's not it a bad thing. Bad. Um, my second sabbatical I did at the Five College Women's Studies Research Center, which is in Western Massachusetts. Okay. And it's shared by University of Massachusetts, Mount Holyoke, Smith, Hampshire, and Amherst Colleges. Wow. So it was sort of feminist paradise. Um, and the third sabbatical, what did I do for that one? Oh, by then I was involved in a long distance relationship with the man whom I grieve in this book called Grief's Country. Uh, my husband, Bob, uh, we were together for 18 years long distance and he was at the time living in Colorado. So I went out there for that sabbatical. Okay. And actually our year out there is one that I chronicle in, in the book, in Grief's mm -hmm. Country. There's a chapter about that. So your earlier books, were they all more of, uh, you know, in subject on feminism then? Is that? Uh, the first one is, um, the first one is called Calling, subtitled Essays on Teaching in the Mother Tongue, mm -hmm. which was about teaching and feminism in the academic world and, and my own self-discovery. I mean, one of the hallmarks of creative nonfiction is the absolute presence of the subjective I, I and the letter I. Um, you don't try to factor yourself out. In fact, you ground everything in yourself, in your own presence, in your imagination. Okay. And so that's what the first book was about. The second one is kind of a goulash of things. Um, there's some feminism in there. There's some, dare I say it, critical race theory in okay. there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was getting very interested in racial issues in literary study and in the academic world, and I was writing about that. Um, and some cultural criticism, some autobiography. Um, I'm not as proud of that book. It's, in, it's got some interesting things in it, um, but it needs an editor really badly. Um, and then the third one that I wrote was uh, on my final sabbatical in 2007, 2008. And that is a book called The Events of October, Murder-Suicide on a Small Campus. And it's the story of a student murder-suicide that happened at Kalamazoo College in wow. 1999. Okay. Um, and that was a really unusual book for me because it was not so grounded in personal experience, even though I was there when it happened. It's more a chronicle of how that crime happened and what happened to the campus afterwards. Sure. So it was more journalistic, actually. So Long you, form of journalism. You did each of those books on sabbatical and then you retired in 2013. So obviously, I mean, I, I have an idea as what the impetus of Graves Country, but what really brought you to the decision to do the book on Greaves Country? Because I mean, it's a, it's an intimate look, right? I mean, this is- yeah, very, very. Some people have found it sort of shockingly uh, intimate or honest or something Why? direct. I guess people, well, we'll, we'll get back to it, but um, yeah, talking please. about grief is not something that Americans do easily. No. <laughs> um, what brought me to the decision to do the book? Um, there was no decision to do the book, Tim. The book, crept up on me. How? It was very how, how so? Yeah, this is the only time this has ever happened to me. Yeah. What happened is that the, the last full essay in the book, um, which is about the night that my cat brought an owl into the house. I'll just let that sink in for a minute. The cat mm -hmm. brought a full grown owl into the house or at least a mostly full-grown owl into the house. Sure. Um, 
And I wrote about it for a local magazine called Encore, which is called subtitled, I think, the Magazine of Southwest Michigan. And it's sort of an arts and local culture magazine. Yeah, I've seen and it. A, f- a friend of mine um, was the arts editor and asked me to contribute something. And so I wrote this piece about the this mysterious dramatic event of this big white bird being carried onto my porch by this little white cat. Um, and even when I was finishing that essay and sending it off to Encore, I thought to myself, there's more to this. This is about Bob's death somehow. I didn't know how, but sometimes nature just offers you the perfect metaphor. And this time she did. She offered up this bird and owls have traditionally been seen as messengers from the other side. In, really? some, in many cultures, not just in ours, but in many cultures. Um, okay. Because they travel by night and they're sort of mysterious and sure. they are always asking the question, who? You know, so, so I rewrote the essay and incorporated Bob's death and sent it off and it got published and it got nominated for an award and it was really popular. And so I wrote another one and then I wrote another one. And then I wrote another one. And by the time I was into the third or fourth essay about my experience of profound trauma and grief, um, I one day just said to myself, you know, you might as well admit that you're writing a book. And I didn't really want to because I didn't want to go back there. Sure. I didn't want to go back to losing him and to the sort of profound um, submersion and grief that I experienced afterwards. But it just wouldn't leave me alone. So I wrote the book kind of backwards. I started with the essays that are uh, furthest away Mm -hmm. from his death and worked my way back to the night of his death. Um, And by then I was in it. I just knew I was writing a book and it started to seem to have some shape. So this one was very evolutionary. How's that for a long answer to your question? No, it's a great answer. I mean, I, and that's really what we try to do in this series is really try to figure out how people wrote their books, yeah. how it came about. Well, so, sometimes, you know, there's a book you need to write and sometimes you don't, or you're trying to avoid it. And the book just says, nope, nope, got to write it, got to write it, got to write it. And that's the way this happened. So, I mean, was it a gradual process? Was it something when you, you know, had the owl brought to you by your cat? I mean, (laughs) immediately it consumed you every day. Like, what what was that process like? Once, you know, something something like that happens to you, it stays in your mind. I mean, it's in your imagination. Um, I mean, I couldn't get over how astonishing it was that this bird landed on my porch. I had to, the bird was in shock, but not dead. Oh, it was alive. And I had to lift it up and take it outside and put it down, right. hoping that it would fly away, and it did, um, which was some kind of good omen uh, for me at the time. Um, but there were already germs of other essays lurking in my imagination. And I just gradually, I guess, gave them permission to announce themselves and st- gave myself permission to start writing about it. And that's how that happened. And did you have any intention with those germs of ideas to write about your husband's death? Before Uh, the end? There's a moment in the book when I'm standing, we were, his death happened at a cabin that we owned in Mm -hmm. um, Northwestern Michigan, south of Kalkaska on the Manistee River. And he probably had a heart attack and fell into the river. We will never know. The cause of death on the death certificate says drowning, but I doubt it. Um, That happened one night and we were alone there and it was uh, as close to a nightmare as I'm ever going to live. The next morning, um, I family and his family, his sister and brother and son were on their way up to be with me but it was going to take some hours for them to get there and I was standing there in the cabin on this bright morning on May 9th um, 2008 and I heard this voice in my head say 
damn it, you're going to have to write about this too. And it just almost made me sick. I just thought I can't even ever face that. But I knew myself well enough to know that some years down the pike, this was too big an experience not to write about. I mean, so 2008 was the death. I mean, we're talking now, what, 15? I wrote the OWL essay in 2010. 2010. And then kept going and kept going and kept going. And the book was complete, I think, in something like 2016, 2017. I gave it to a couple of other people to look at. Sure. I did huge amounts of editing and rewriting. I, I think I sent it to Wayne State University Press, my publisher, in maybe 2018. Okay. So there's about eight years there for the whole process to take place. It got rejected all over the place too. Did it? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean that, I got to admit, you know, that's the thing that always intimidates people, right? Even myself about writing, right. you know, getting rejected, but with something so personal, I mean, did you, in your previous works, did you get rejected in the same way or in the same? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think you've got to be very clear about the fact that at least one wall of the room you're writing in is going to be covered with rejection before you can call yourself a writer. Gotcha. Only they don't send rejections on pieces of paper anymore, so you can't really cover the wall. But metaphorically, you have to think of one big wall covered with rejection before you really have the right to call yourself a writer. Okay. Yeah, and people, you get rejected for all kinds of reasons. Um, some of them having nothing to do with the quality of your work. But yeah, this was a hard one to get rejected. But frankly, by the time it became a book, I think by the time any personal writing that's very close to you gets finished, whatever that means, turns into whatever it's going to turn into, it's become more of an object. It's less personal. It's. Um, but I mean, this was a highly personal experience. Yeah, very. But I've written highly personal stuff before. I mean, the first book is really personal. Okay. I have all the remaining copies because the publisher went out of print. So if you want one, I'll send it to you free. <laughs> um, we collect Michigan authors. So, I mean, anything you've written, we'll add to our collections if we don't already super. have it. I'll mail it off. Um, I, tend, I tend to write very personally. Um, people always, a lot of readers have said to me, it's so, it's so, how do you, how do you put these personal things on paper? You've just bared your soul and I always say you don't know what I didn't include you know I mean it seems like you're divulging every single thing in your heart but you're not <laughs> um, what you are is making um, making a, a work of art yeah uh, and finally it becomes that thing that you're making and you have that a little bit of artistic distance on it so when somebody rejected the book, I did not feel they were rejecting my grief. I felt like they were rejecting my book. Mm. That's almost as hard for me. Um, yeah. If you don't like my writing, you don't like me, frankly. <laughs> but, um, but I, you know, you just have to accept it. You just get used to that. So can I ask about that process with the editing and with, you know, the selection, yeah. what should go in, what shouldn't go in? first with with the people who were reading this i mean what were the what were the things they were saying to you as they were reading the, the work as it was progressing i mean was it you know like you said earlier were some of your not critics but audience you know it's too personal what were they saying to you um i gave grief's country to four close friends first because they were eager to read it they'd all been um really important people to me when Bob died and good friends for years and years and years. Um, so I gave it to them. I don't expect critical feedback from them. Mm -hmm. When it got closer to publication and I was at a point where I thought, I don't know what to do with it now. I don't know what it needs. 
Then I sought out some professional help. I approached two writers. Um, one of them uh, was a friend, but not a close friend. Somebody I'd met once and corresponded with. Um, there's no secret about it. Her name is Renee Dow, and she's the author of Body of a Dancer. Okay. A wonderful book about her time in New York being a dancer. Um, and the other one was Sarah Einstein, who is um, a well-known nonfiction writer who got a very important award for her memoir called Mott, M-O-T, about her strange relationship with a homeless man, a very interesting homeless man. Hmm. Um, and I had heard through a friend that Sarah was interested in doing some editing. I offered to pay them both. Um, Renee said, absolutely not, you're a friend. Sarah said, absolutely, yes. And so I paid her a large amount of money. And they both read the manuscript and gave me excellent usable feedback. Um, they were both very um, positive, very encouraging. Uh, that I had a book, that it was a real book, that it had legs, it could walk, it was good, it was coherent. Um, lots of uh, particular feedback on particular parts of the book. Sarah, in particular, went through it line by line and just did amazing, amazing, um, very critical. And I don't mean by that negative, I mean very looking very closely at it. Right. Feedback. So that was just beyond useful. It was just wonderful. They both <laughs> had, they both intersected on one criticism, which is interesting because they're really different people, very different writers. Both of them said, you know, there's not a lot of Bob in this book. We don't get to know him at all. You've left him out. And um, something in the back of my head knew that was true. And I knew there was a reason I'd left him out. And that was that as painful as it was to write about my grief being without Bob, um, it was excruciating to think about writing about my time with Bob. That was much more painful for me. Really? Oh yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. Um, but I thought, you know, don't ask for feedback unless you're willing to take it. So you got to do this. So I wrote one more essay for the book, and that's the second chapter. It's called Ghost Town, and it's about our time in Colorado. Okay. And it was the hardest thing to write in the book. That's what I was going to ask. I was going to ask what was the hardest part of the whole. Oh, and th that writing that one was like taking out my appendix with a salad fork. It was just <laughs> terrible. Um, but I gave myself a deadline. I rented a place up on the Leelanau Peninsula for I think three weeks maybe. And I gave myself two weeks to write this chapter and it was done in six days Wow! because I just sat down every day as if there was a gun to my head and said, you will write the following section of this essay today. So that's mm -hmm. how that happened. And then that selection process, I mean, was it a combination of you and your readers who basically said, take this out? I mean, or are you, you know, you said there's there's a lot of pieces that didn't make the book. Well, nobody what? said nobody said take anything out. Everybody liked all of the essays that were there. Right. Um, criticism was more like, um, oh, I don't know. I don't understand what you're saying here. This repeats something you did earlier. Um, what if this section went here instead of there? sort of smaller criticism like that. Okay. Nobody said take something out. What about you? What was the criteria of what went in and what didn't? Just too personal? Nope. The pieces that didn't go in? Um, I'm trying, I'm not hesitating. I'm just trying to think back to what it, what it might've been. No, of course, that's fine. I, um, 
I suppose there were some really personal details of our relationship that I decided not to include. Um, out of respect for Bob and also out of respect for his children. Okay. Who I, his adult children who I knew would probably read the book. Yeah. Although I don't know if they have or not. <laughs> um, I always tell people you don't have to read it, honest. Um, and some people fairly close to me or close to him have not read it, I think. And that's fine. Just too um, personal for them, do yeah. you think? Yeah, too painful. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But a lot of my editing is about structure. It's about organization. It's about sentence structure. Sure. I mean, I work on the sentence level really hard on myself to make sure the sentences are fashioned the way I want them fashioned. I'm very particular about how the whole essay is organized. Um, and I went back at the very, very last minute when they were putting this book to bed at Wayne State University Press and said, hold, hold the presses. I have to reorganize one of the essays. Okay. And I could, across the miles, I could feel them throwing their hands up in the air and going, oh God, we hate authors. <laughs> but they, were, they were very nice and said, okay, but you've only got a short time to do it. And I said, I can do it overnight. And I did it. Nice. And it was, it was just rearranging one of the essays, yeah. So going back to rejection, I mean, how many different places do you think just general you know that rejected you before you finally got accepted by Wayne State gosh I honestly have no memory of that and have kept okay. no records of it multiple okay. certainly multiple and when Wayne accepted it I mean you know what was the feeling gratitude thank God it's over gratitude and relief yes Okay. Wayne did my last book too. They did the book on the murder suicide. Okay. Um, so I trusted them. I knew they would do a good job. They have wonderful editors there. Um, they put a team to work on the book that really cared about the book. And that was the experience that I had the, on the previous occasion too. So I was very relieved to have it in good hands. Very nice. So for you, what are your favorite uh, pieces or essays? in this work oh gosh um you only have to select one it's okay i have i have a i have a warm spot for the one about the owl which is called the messenger right um i have a particular fondness for one called singular bird which is about um a very important journey i took up to the san juan islands off the coast of washington state Mm -hmm. um, a couple of years after Bob died. Um, and I had sort of a mythic encounter with a great blue heron on the shore there. Nice. Um, and I had a devil of a time publishing that essay. About half of this book appeared in print um, before the book came out. Okay. Four, four, I guess, four or five of the essays were published independently. And I couldn't get a publisher for Singular Bird um, cause it's kind of a strange essay, uh, where my journey to the islands is cross cut or braided with the story of, um, Admiral George Vancouver and his voyage of discovery into Puget Sound in 1792. Hmm. Now what they have to do with each other, God only knows, but I decided they did. So I wrote this thing, and finally, um, just before the book went to press, uh, the essay got accepted. So I'm 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 fond of it because that journey was so important in my in my recovery from Bob's death, and um, because I am kind of fond of the way that I braided my own experience with something that happened 300 years earlier, 200 years earlier. Sure. So let me ask you, I mean, you talk about how that essay helped you in, in, in the grieving process, if I may call it that. Um, yeah. do you, how did you feel the writing of the book, the publishing of the book? Did that, did that help at all? Did it? Um, 
I think writing the book and finishing the book helped more than publishing the book. Okay. Because it, it felt, it feels like, um, I always think of ceramics for some reason. It feels like you take the raw clay of personal experience and make something useful and hopefully beautiful out of it. Sure. Um, and then it goes into the kiln and comes out. Um, and when you when it comes out, you're done with it. So when the book is published, I'm done with it. I'm not. I'm not feeling the sense of accomplishment so much. Um, certainly, when people read it and tell me what they like about it and tell me certain pieces of it that had some power for them, I do feel that that accomplishment and that sense of of um, having gone through something very very difficult and made something out of it that speaks to other people. Sure. So there's an element of that. But for me, mostly the recovery part happened with the writing of the book itself. Okay. So with, you know, obviously, um, you know, you, you, you've gotten acclaim for the book and you won a Michigan Novel Book Award. But with this strange year that we've just been through and your book is, you know, yeah. how has that experience been for you? I mean, have you done readings? Have you... Have, I, you know, I haven't done readings. Um, the book came out <laughs> on March 10th, 2020. The week before, the week before the, everything. I right? believe the state of Michigan closed on March 13th. Okay, three days before. So I thought, well, there went that book launch. <laughs> I immediately had to cancel the launch reading here in Kalamazoo. I'm sorry to laugh. It's just, yes. Oh boy, it was, yeah, yeah it was quite a year. Uh -huh. Um so I haven't done Zoom readings or anything. I have done a lot of book clubs. Oh, really? And Zoomed in with groups of people who've read the book. Nice. Locally and not so locally. Um, and talk to them about it. And that's been a lot of fun. Has it? Yeah. And I mean, what's, what's the reception been like and with, with book clubs? I mean, because you have people who are really like, I mean, they've invested very, probably a month of their lives into your book. Very, very positive. Um, they there there's this obvious concern for me and whether i can actually do this conversation with them so sure. i always preface it by saying the first thing you need to know is this happened 13 years ago and i'm fine so you can ask me anything you want about my relationship with bob our very brief marriage we were married for four months and one week when he died um, the writing of the book, anything you want to ask. And you can see everybody go, oh, like they're so relieved <laughs> that I'm not going to burst into tears or whatever. Right, right. Yeah. But again, for me, we're talking about an artistic object. We're not talking about my actual experience anymore. And do you like going back and looking at that object? Or do you want to just forge your head onto another? So ask that question again. I didn't quite well, hear you. Well, you describe it as an artistic object. You're, you're somehow yeah. removed from it now. Do you like going back and looking at that object or do you want to just... Yes, I do. It? You do? I do, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, sometimes I'll read little bits of it and the feelings will all come back. Um, even the dangerous feelings. But I can manage them now. I know how to manage them. Okay. Um, that's how you recover from grief. You don't stop grieving. You just learn how to manage the grief. Sure. And it occupies less space inside you. Um, and then with the pandemic, you yeah. know, obviously like a... Uh, yeah, it, it turned an imposed, out... It's an imposed sabbatical. Is there something you've been working on <laughs> in this past year? Um, Yes, I worked uh, really hard on an essay that turned out to be very difficult about racial memory and the history of Kalamazoo. Oh. I'm really taken up these days with the way this country is or isn't looking at its past and the way our very fraught past around race comes up when we talk about monuments and public art. Mm. Um, the way monuments are being argued about, 
replaced, displaced, taken down, um, memorialized. I'm just, I'm fascinated by all that. I've always been convinced that the United States um, is like a person who has a great trauma in his past and can't bear to look at it, but can't move forward until it does. <laughs> So I'm watching this drama take place and I decided to write about how it took place in Kalamazoo um, around a piece of sculpture in our central little park downtown, Bronson Park. Um, Which sculpture? I've been to Bronson Park. I, I, I... Well, it's been removed by vote of the city commission, I'm happy to say, because I wanted it removed. Right. It was called the Fountain of the Pioneers. Okay. And it was the work of um, a sculptor named Ionelli, who was a student of Frank Lloyd Wright. And it had a white man standing with a great big high, some people called it a club. I don't think it was a club. It was supposed to symbolize something or other, but a big tall, like piece of wood in his hands and kneeling at his feet or at least way down below him was the figure of a so-called Indian. Um, and the reason you knew that is that there was this huge headdress of feathers going all the way down his back. Okay. Now, no indigenous person in the Great Lakes ever wore that kind of headdress. It's completely culturally wrong, okay. but it symbolized Indian. And Ionelli talked about the sculpture as indicating that the noble Indian was um, succumbing to the force of the white settlers. Now, I always thought that was a remarkably horrible thing to memorialize in the park. Okay. Um, and a lot of other people did too. And it finally went to the city commission to decide and they heard all kinds of testimony on both sides, including the testimony of the Machibanashiwish band of Potawatomi who um, were able to remain in this area of Michigan af after the other Potawatomi were marched out and driven west. Sure. Um, and their word, they did a, a statement from the tribe um, there was a very interesting statement, but because they did not recommend removing the sculpture. They didn't. They didn't. They also didn't re recommend keeping the sculpture. They essentially said, what's important to us is that people know we're still here, that we are thriving, we are a self-sufficient community, um, and we were not driven out or absorbed or uh, eliminated. And I was fascinated by that, that their issue was not with this piece of representation, which I thought was awful, but with people knowing that indigenous people still live. They're not, they're not creatures from a past mythology. You know, they're real people, real Americans. And right. they're here. And I thought that's important to write about too. So this turned into a very complicated essay. And is that where your essay went on their response? Yeah. Well, I included their response, yeah. Um, I didn't make a judgment in the essay about the, the sculpture, although I think it's pretty clear <laughs> how I feel about it. Right, right. Um, although I do understand the point of view of people who said, this is censorship, this is an important piece of art, et cetera, et cetera. Um, my point was, it is probably an important piece of art and it belongs in a museum. Mm. where it can be contextualized and talked about as um, a point of view about indigenous people that was very popular when the sculpture went up. And how, when did it go up? 20s? Uh, 30s? 1940s, I think. Okay. 30s or 40s, I can't remember offhand. Okay. Yeah. Right. Very interesting. It's gone. Yeah. But other things happened in the park that are interesting. I mean, Abraham Lincoln spoke in the park. Mm -hmm. About, that was the only appearance in Michigan, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, mm. in 1856, um, stumping for John C. Fremont for president mm -hmm. on the Republican. He was the first candidate of the new Republican Party. 
Right. Uh, and what Nixon talked about was the issue of slavery. Um, and he said, there's probably no other issue to be talking about because he said, what this country is about is self-creation. A man, and he would have used that language, that a, every man can invent himself. And so that notion of self-invention is something that fascinates me and who it is in our past that has had the freedom to invent themselves. Um, and what that sculpture, the Fountain of the Pioneers, had to say about who gets to invent whom. Um, so all of those issues are, are very live for me, and I've put them all into an essay that keeps getting rejected all over the place. I was going to ask. I want to read it. No, it's it sounds uh, fascinating. Well, I think I really labored over it. Maybe I labored labored too much over it, but it was very hard to coordinate. At the very least, I'm going to go walk in. Brownson I hope it, if it ever gets published, I'll let you know. <laughs> well, at the very least, I'm going to go walk in Brownson Park. Uh, and yeah, look around more closely because it's a lovely park. I definitely think that's yeah. a great park. Yeah. Well, Gail, thank you. And, and let me ask, what did, what did it mean to you to be chosen as a Michigan Notable Book author? Oh, after a year like this, <laughs> and after a book launch that went straight into the gutter, I was, <laughs> thrilled, I was just thrilled that anybody noticed the book. Um, and I also have to say that I think of myself pretty centrally as a Michigan writer. Sure. Michigan is where I was born. It's where I was raised. It's where I spent my career. Didn't want to spend my career here, but I got the job in Kalamazoo, so I came back. I yeah. thought I was moving away for good. Um, landed back here, and um, my roots in Michigan go very deep, and this book is in a lot of ways very much about the Michigan landscape. So I'm, I'm very honored to be recognized by my state in some way, and certainly the Michigan Library represents the best of my state. So I was, I was just thrilled. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you. And thank you for your sharing your work with the world and with us. It's my and, honor. And thank you for being here with us today. And thank you to all our viewers. And again, this was Gail Griffin, uh, Griefs Country from Wayne State University Press. And again, this is Michigan Notable Books 2021 Author Award Winners uh, video series. And you can find more of those at the Library of Michigan website. Gail, thank you very much for today. Thank you, Tim. It's been lovely.